On the table in front of me right now is my production Synology RS3617XS that is responsible of all file and block related storage in my home. The current problem with it, as you can hear, is the fact that it's loud, obnoxious and not very pleasant to work next to. An American machine, if you wish. Therefore, I'll spend this video taking on the noise issue by up and down, perhaps even side grading to different components and if it goes all well, significantly add to the cool factor of the storage array. I would mute the sound of the video to make it more pleasant to listen at, but instead let's remove the fans and give you an idea of the goal that I'm aiming for. Very nice indeed. I don't aim for quiet, I aim for silence. The unit is still powered on at this time, so to prevent CPU or disk drive overheating, I'll put the fans back in. I'll take the top of the audio off, just to make it a better listening experience for you. Let's put the lid back on the main compartment to better direct air over the live components. This Synology box, like so many other 2U nodes, uses four 80mm fans for active cooling. They sit cradled in these neat toolless hot swap caddies, and with their slightly deeper than usual 32mm profile, they are great at two primary tasks, moving air and letting humans know that they exist. I'll be swapping aim to 80 by 25 mm Noctua fans instead. These fans move significantly less air, but for my tasks they should work plenty. Routing the replacement fans, now slightly longer than stock fan cables, is a bit of a fiddly task, but with some bends and folds you can make it work. I'll bring the volume back up in the video so we can appreciate the work that we've already accomplished. The beeping sound that you hear in the background is caused by the unit noticing a missing fan and the alarm will stop in a few minutes. Let's put the unit back together and see where we're at. Let's move on to the next job. Just a second ago, I told you that this server is cooled by four 80mm fans, which is actually a small lie. There is a fifth fan within the stock power supply, which also suffers from the ketchup and mustard syndrome on its cable harness, and I don't really like that. I want my machines to look as sleek on the inside as they do on the outside. Therefore, I'll be swapping out the stock power supply. The goal of this task is threefold. I want to improve noise by removing the internal fan. I want to lower total system power draw by upgrading to a more efficient power supply. And hopefully, I'll have marginally increased airflow due to less restricted cable management. Removing the stock power supply is as easy as it is in any other computer. It is just a regular ATX power supply after all. I'll start by first removing the EPS connector, which in this case is the slightly unusual 4-pin variant. I'll then remove the 24-pin power cable that fits snugly under the middle structural cross brace of the case, and then lastly I'll remove the 6 Molex connectors responsible of powering the backplane with the drives. At this time, the stock cable harness can be taken out of the machine so it won't get stuck later. Once all the cables are relieved from duty, there's just four screws left before the power supply can be removed. Speaking of the stock power supply, it's a 500 watt bronze rated power supply manufactured by Delta Electronics. I wouldn't call it a bad unit by any stretch, but in my machines I want great units. I'm swapping out the stock power supply with a gold efficiency rated 600 watt SFX BSU from Corsair. Corsair have released a new platinum model, but I got this gold one for dimes on the dollar on the used market. I've chosen the SFX form factor specifically because it will allow the fan in the power supply unit to not have restricted airflow in the 2U case, as it won't be sitting directly next to either the top or the bottom of the case. Using the SFX form factor does necessitate the use of an adapter plate which converts SFX units to fit in the larger brother's footprint. Luckily for me, the SF600 comes with this adapter plate in the box, but even if it didn't, they can be bought for next to nothing on eBay. Once the adapter plate has been installed, we can reuse the stock screws to mount the new power supply to the case. I'll then be going over the four screws one last time to torque them down, and a good wiggle to ensure that I can proudly proclaim this ain't going anywhere. The 
The SF600 PSU that I installed comes with a very short 24 pin power cable, which makes cable management in this case a breeze. The EPS connector comes as the split 4 plus 4 variant, but I'll just use one half of the cable. I guess I could cut the cable to remove the unused wires, but I want the ability to use this cable in another computer, in another project, at another time. Corsair uses 6-pin PCIe connectors to supply power to three Molex connectors on a single cable, so therefore I'll be using two of these cables to power the backplane. The Molex area is a bit messy for my liking, but without making custom cables, there's not really anything I can do about that right now. Let's replug into mains power. Then we can power on the server. And I'll reinstall the fan that I removed to give space to my working fingers. At this time, Let's cut the music so we can listen to this beautifully quiet result. The server should finish its boot sequence in just a second. There we have the beep. Yes. And there we have me making a quiet celebration on camera. I could and probably should call it quits here, but I'm not done at all. The next upgrade is purely for performance. I'll be maxing out the RAM that this unit supports by adding two additional 8GB RAM sticks for a total of 32GB system memory. It's not marvelous by today's standard, but neither are my requirements for the storage array. Even if I don't manage to use all of the RAM in application memory, having additional room for system caches will make frequent reads far faster, small writes almost instantaneous, and the overall system snappiness should be greatly elevated from this upgrade. I guess only time will tell. Since the system won't be touched for a long time after this upgrade session is finished, I'm tying down all loose cable ends with zip ties to the case. I can't really decide if this is done from a point of neatness or a point of performance. Perhaps I do it as a safety measure to make sure that a shifting cable won't short up the unit. But then again, when has a plastic cable ever managed to do that? I guess the real answer I'm looking for is that I do this because I think it's fun. There's a soothing quality to making sure that things look neat, especially if I'm only the one that knows this fact. Looking at the footage now, I see the double standards imposed on me by talking about neatness while completely missing the point about cleaning old accumulated dust away from the case. But then again, who's perfect? The Molex cables are being tied together to form a single bulky cable, and once again, great neatness could be achieved by making custom cables, but I'll tuck the excess length into this little nook between the side panel and the power supply. I'll then be using these zip tie anchors that will be mounted on the side panel using an adhesive tape to secure the new Molex cables to the case wall. I'll also be installing these air baffles back in. It's another one of those upgrades that probably won't make any real-world difference, but in theory restricting airflow to desired areas will make the cooling system need to work less hard to perform the same amount of work, which is exactly what I'm trying to aim for. I cut two additional air baffles to sit next to the CPU. I realize now just how lovely it would have been to have firmly benchmarked the server before and after upgrades, but with the amount of stuff that I'm changing right now, I can't really say what upgrade is responsible for what reduction. Besides, this video is not about the scientific method, it's about stupid upgrades to an already outdated system. What you're looking at now is me unpackaging this envelope of 8mm Mod DIY sound dampening phone material. I would leave a link in the video description to where you can purchase the stuff, but apparently I got the very last section of stock, as they only shipped me half the foam I actually ordered. After talking to support, they ended up refunding me my order. I can't really say anything bad about the experience. Support staff was really nice to me, but it doesn't look like this product will be restocked anytime soon. It's probably a good thing, because I don't expect this foam to do any wonders for the system noise after all. It's another one of those, because I can, and because I think it's fun, kind of upgrades. 
That being said, the foam is easy to work with, and with its pre-applied adhesive backside, it's also a breeze to install. I didn't really have a plan on how or where to apply foam, I just went with the more is merrier kind of approach. And thus, I probably could have achieved a better result by not just throwing myself headfirst into cutting and applying. I'm really just trying to be covering as much surface as possible with the material, in the hopes of covering up or perhaps just muffling any lingering fan sounds. I don't know how any of this stuff works. I'm not an audio engineer by any stretch of the imagination. But even if the foam does nothing, it does result in a black appearance of the inside of the case, which is cool. Applying the foam on the side walls was tricky, and as you can see, the result that was not really great looking. Let's move on. If you thought I was done upgrading RAM, you thought wrong. I visited my parents this weekend and rummaged through one of my old parts bins, where I found these copper RAM heatsinks specifically made for DDR3 RAM. How lucky am I? I only have four of them, which is half of what I need, since my current RAM sticks have memory modules on both sides, but I don't really want to try and track down this exact model of RAM heatsink. And besides, even cooling one side of the stick should bring down the package temperature of the entire DIMM. Did I mention that it looks absolutely sick? <laughs> At least I think so. Let's upgrade all four. Only the powers of a keen eye, or me telling you, should alert the observant viewer that a few weeks have passed between the last clip and this one. I've been patiently waiting for the last part to arrive, the new CPU. I'm actually not upgrading this component, rather I'm going to be downgrading. You see, the stock CPU is a Xeon E3 1230V2. With its 4 cores and 8 threads it has a TDP of 69 watts. Nice! It's an alright chip for its age, but it's massively overkill for the CPU performance I need. All of my compute tasks are on separate machines, so this Synology box is only responsible of serving files. That's a task which the replacement CPU will carry out just fine. Opening up the retention mechanism of the CPU socket, this will give me a convenient place to lay the new chip for your viewing pleasure. The new chip is a Xeon E3 1220L V2. It has only two cores, there's no hyper threading, but with a TDP of just 17 watts, it'll run much cooler than the old 1230 V2 that's currently in the system. One could make an argument that the faster CPU will just clock down when idle and thus use the same amount of power, but I'm convinced that an idle core will still use more power than a core that simply does not exist. I'm using isopropyl alcohol to dissolve the old thermal paste and clean the CPU. The same treatment will be given to the heatsink before I'll apply a new dose of thermal paste and reseed the cooler onto the new CPU. Changing the CPU to another model is another one of those modifications that to me is more about fun than it is about searching for additional performance. Tweaking systems is fun, and I like to spend the extra time to have my systems exactly as I want them. The last thing to do here is to remember to install the air baffles, and we should be off to the races. I'm feeling fairly confident at the system at this time, so I'll go ahead and put it right back into the rack. I'm using a shallow rack, so I won't be using any rails, and it's a bit more tricky than it could be. Let's power up the unit again and check how it sounds. I'll boost this clip by 30 decibels so you can appreciate just how quiet the fans are compared to the internal drives. Nice! The last step of this process is to lock in and verify the validity of the performance upgrades that I've made. The additional RAM can be seen from the control panel. We see a CPU temperature of 40 degrees, which is a lot higher than I was expecting for such a low wattage chip. But then again, it's well within spec, so I won't be doing anything about it at this time. The CPU still registers as the old 1230V2, and that seems to be stuck. I'll check via SSH and see if that tells a different story. 
Looking at PROC CPU info, we see that the CPU has indeed been downgraded to a Xeon 1220L. The dashboard seems to be hard-coded in place, but it won't affect me the slightest. Thank you for listening to me ramble about upgrades to a decade-old NAS box. I hope to have you as a viewer in the future. Have a great day.